You know what changes? Everything. Times change. Technology changes. People change. Sometimes it seems overnight. You can resist it. You can adapt to it. But you can't ignore it. Our thinking is to lead it by changing the way we work, changing the way expectations are met, leading clients and the practice of law forward. You know what that changes? Everything. Hi, I'm Dawn Chief, co-owner and executive editor of Atlantic Business Magazine, and this is Take 5 with the Top 50. It's a video interview series where we speak to each of our 2020 Top 50 CEO Award winners. In just five questions, we try to find out what makes them tick. I'm joined here today by the CEO of Ignite Fredericton and Knowledge Park, Larry Shaw. Larry, thanks so much for joining me. Um, for about 20 years, or maybe even 25 years, Fredericton has been really trying to change its economic development footprint. And in doing that, it's tried to move away from maybe more traditional economic uh, means and commercial activity into a knowledge-based sector. And back, you know, 20 or 22 years ago, it was decided that building infrastructure and, and sort of establishing a cluster environment around knowledge industries would be a good strategy. And that was the birth of Knowledge Park. Knowledge Park is owned, it is a for-profit private company, but it's owned by Ignite Fredericton. Ignite Fredericton is what you would typically describe as an NGO or, a, or a, a, you know, an operation for economic development. So how they work together, how they collaborate is, is Ignite, and, and you know, I, I'm obviously CEO of both those questions, so I some, sometimes find myself having a conversation with myself, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, I, those are the arguments that I actually win when I'm, when I'm debating with myself. But um, Ignite sets the stage for strategy and sets uh, the priorities for what we want to work on from, techno from, a, from an economic development perspective. And Knowledge Park implements the infrastructure elements of that. So building infrastructure to support economic development, um, building technologies to support the economic development. Uh, the most recent uh, project that we have on the go is the Cyber Center. Cyber Center is Canada's largest um, capital program in, ca in uh, cybersecurity literally. So um, you might not see that in Fredericton as being the leader of cyber technology in, in at a national level, but we certainly are. So that's just an example of how Knowledge Parks work, but it it's really comes together at the board level for Knowledge Park and Ignite Fredericton. Uh, we have two separate boards, but they're the same members. So we operate um, both boards, um, you know, simultaneously to, uh, to, to deal with both strategy and, and governance of the organization. You know, the pandemic, those of us, all of us that are living through the pandemic, it's it's affecting it's affecting all of us. And by no means do I need mean to underscore that, you know, it hasn't been tough and it hasn't, you know, been a serious situation for all of us to deal. Um, so kudos to all of those that are trying to make ends meet and trying to trying to, you know, stay positive and move things forward. But at the same time, I think we've been preparing for um, you know, events like this that cause really foundational level changes. We've been preparing for that for quite some time, just in by the agenda of moving from, you know, a traditional based economy into a knowledge based economy. So a lot of the things that you would see that needed to be reacted to very quickly, such as deployment of technology, moving from in phase, you know, place to place in, in person person meetings to virtual meetings and things like that. So we we were really Moving into the pandemic, we were set up, I think, quite quite well to begin to have to address that change. So within a very short period of time, literally within days, if not hours, we moved a significant amount of the programs that we were all to being online, as much did uh, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations did. But at the same time, what we found ourselves was in a situation where all of the businesses that were here may have not had the same advantage as we had to maybe understand technology to begin to deploy it. So we, we found ourselves thrown right into the middle of, of all of those needs of the businesses in, in the, in, you know, here locally. So that became, you know, number one priority is how do we help those companies, uh, individuals get through the myriad of programs that were coming out, but just the tons and tons of questions of what do I do now? Um, and, and that became the very sort of, early action of the pandemic, it became sort of a, you know, it was a reactive phase. 
But very quickly, though, I think we realize that sooner or later, we are going to start to have to focus on the recovery. We're going to have to focus on what are those elements that happened during the pandemic or are still happening in the pandemic that we've learned from and turn those into opportunities, sort of make sure that we try to, to continue to look at things with a bit of a glass half full, uh, enough negative, enough stress, enough pressure was from pandemic. But we found, we actually found uh, pathways to new services. We found pathways to new technology uh, deployment and also to new services and, and opportunities that business could take advantage of, moving from a traditional sales channel into an e-commerce channel or helping to understand, you know, how do you operationalize, you know, door, uh, you know drop-off delivery and all of those things that companies tried to do in a very short period of time. Um, you know, we were able to use what we did as examples for companies and help them through that, uh, help them through that phase. But if you look at just a few things that gives the insight as to what are the opportunities that are coming or have come out of pandemic, just look at the healthcare as an example. In our region, I don't know the exact numbers, but a very high, a large percentage of, of doctor visits um, turn to become online. And we spent years trying to figure out how do you get the public to do online medicine or, um, you know, and in a matter of hours or, or weeks and few or days, we, we moved into, you know, a, a significant amount of the medical um, appointments were being handled online. If you look at the the um, the emergency rooms, it was the intention of to avoid crowding our our emergency rooms. But at the same time, there was you know we we dropped something like sixty or seventy percent of the activity in the emergency rooms was moved to an online solution. So when you think of using emergency rooms for prescriptions or renewals or things that aren't really emergencies. You know, it, it really opened the, the eyes, I think, of a lot of people of what the art of the possible is. And then the position that we have in technology, I think we're just expanding that to how does that uh, how does that impact other business and what are the opportunities there? So um, it's, it, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't want to under, underscore the stress and the pressure that this caused us and, and every business, but um, there is opportunities and, and we, we need to take advantage of those. A few years ago, um, there was an article written about New Brunswick and, and maybe Fredericton more directly. Um, don't need to mention the, the firm out of Toronto that wrote that article, but it basically said, you know, it basically told the last person to leave the province, please remember to shut out the lights. It was a very pessimistic view to what was actually happening. And look, we have significant structural issues. You know, the demographics of our province is, is just now starting to slightly move in a positive direction. But, you know, it's been well, it's been well touted, all the issues we have. Um, so I don't think we need to spend an awful lot more time talking about how bad things are uh, or how, you know, how, what a hole we've dug for ourselves. And I think we need to start, stop looking through the rear window and start to look through the front window um, and bring those things that we know that we have as advantages and opportunities forward. Um, you know, yes, our economy is going to have to change. Yes, the foundation that has been around for years will begin to shift. Uh, it's not to say that we will not have traditional, you know, uh, economic opportunities. We are, you know, we will still have lots of trees to cut and we will still have lots of potatoes to dig and we'll still have lots of fish in the ocean to, to, to go after and all of those things. So we're not going to be doing away with our, our traditional industry, but there will be a pivoting point. There will be a shift and that shift has to be around the knowledge industry. And that's where we can actually level the playing field at a, at a global level. You know, we are in an era where no longer to have a job um, you have to you you have to move. We're in a, we're in an area an era, pardon me, where technology is enabling us to have the same footprint at a global marketplace as any large jurisdiction does. And there are enough entrepreneurs in the ecosystem and enough uh, support on workforce development and and you know academic research. There's so many things that are that paint a picture of optimism and opportunity for us. You know the one that I'm involved in most heavily right now is cybersecurity. Um, you know, my gracious. Uh, cybersecurity is going to be somewhere around 3.5 million job shortages by the end of 2021. Knowing that and knowing that we are already in a leadership position in cybersecurity by the great work that UNB has done in terms of research chairs and research institutes, we are number one in many cases. 
And why would we not throw all of our cards into that? Why would we not double down on the cybersecurity uh, opportunity? It is here, it is now. We have all the attributes for that. So it's just not about cybersecurity as well. There's other opportunities that look at that or, or look at those same, same characteristics. You know, we've had companies that have doubled their size during the pandemic situation because of the services they were in, they could actually um, expand those and grow those. And they were able to do that without having to jump on planes and, and, and travel around the world because of the network capability or the networking capability we have. So it's for those reasons that I get frustrated when people want to always bring a negative narr- narrative forward, um, you know. Um, I'm great. We're I'm blessed with uh, with having with having uh, six grandchildren, and uh, um, you know uh, if there's anything that keeps me going is to make sure that all those have opportunities in you know the place that they want to live as we go forward. And and uh, you know I've been in the business now probably longer than 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 I like to admit, um, but I can tell you there are more opportunities now than there ever has been. Uh, for this region, and it's be because of the fact that we've made the world flat relative technology. Um, you, when you combine that with our safety now from you know the performance during pa- the the pandemic, you know what a great opportunity for a remote workforce. So you know you you've got a choice that you can live in the place that you want to live. Why not live in New Brunswick? It's a or or right here in Fredericton. You know it's a, I've had the great pleasure of living around the world, and I've always been in New Brunswick, and I always will be because it's a you know, it's hard to beat what we have here. Population and and growth go hand in hand. Um, you know, there is the most basic element, you know, the more people you have, the more commercial activity that you have. Economic development isn't just about commercial activity. Commercial activity is moving a dollar around from one player to the next. Economic development is about creating wealth. It's about creating, you know, expanded opportunities and about bringing in new investment, about bringing in new opportunities to a jurisdiction or, or to an economic base. And population is a way that companies need to have access to talent. So the caveat or the, the descriptor around more people is also to ensure that they are that we're workforce ready, that those the new population is is skilled in the areas that we need them to be skilled in. So hand in hand with population growth is to ensure that your 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 population growth is represented by in the case of immigration, newcomers coming from coming with the skill sets that we need to have them so they can be employed in our marketplace and fill the void that companies have in terms of hiring skilled and, and experienced workers. So yes, it's about population growth. That's the that's the foundation which everything grows from, but it is qualified by ensuring that the population that we have as growth uh, does reflect the, the economy that we're shifting to um, and the skill sets associated to that. When you get it right, you know, and, and it works well. You know, when you when you get the team or you build a team that is running on all cylinders, that is integrated well, is experienced, you know, has passion, has all those things as an entrepreneur, as a as a business owner that you need to move your business forward. It's 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 quite easy to recognize when it's there and when it's working well because you know, no challenge is is too big. You know, you can you I've seen teams do amazing things. Um, well beyond what you would expect them to be able to do. The commitment that employees have, the the, the personal integrity that, that that employees bring forward. Again, I think we are blessed with some of the, the, the best workforce in, in the world, uh, certainly in North America. Um, you know, and that comes from, and it isn't just New Brunswick, I mean, Atlantic Canada, there's a, there's a characteristic of in Atlantic Canada that's different than, than around the world. Um, you know, I think we, I think we bring, um, you know, a, a bit of, of, um, you know, a bit of a, a bit of aggressiveness in in the way we want to tackle things. Um, we don't accept the norms. We want to make change. We want to bring our our best foot forward. Um, you know, way back in the call center era, we were we were touted for being the the best the best at customer service, and that's our characteristic. Is is we really want as people as population to do our very best. So companies benefit from that from that hiring perspective. But as a as a manager, you still have to find a team that works well. Not everybody is is suited for every job not everybody's suited for every team environment so it's very important to make sure that 
not only are you hiring skills, you're hiring best fit. You're hiring people. And I've often said I'd hire people based on attitude before skills on any, any day. I, I can train most skills. It's the attitude. It's the willingness to, you know, get the job done that we're, that we really look for. Um, and that, the you know, spark in the eye of, of having people, you know, uh, simply just look and for better ways and continuous improvement. So it's it's important to make make sure that you're hiring at a at a at a company wide or a team wide so that you're bringing in the the various skills that you need, um, and you have to be honest with yourself with your own abilities and your own team's abilities to know that, you know, in in, in some cases maybe you're looking for leadership skills as much as you are technical skills, or maybe you're looking for collaboration skills as much as you are um, technical skills. So once you start to hire or start to build a team with those attributes. And, and recognize that they are as important as the technical attributes, you're more likely to be successful in getting the proper team. But we all know that we've all been in situations where I think we've not made the right hire or we've hired and things haven't gone as well as they should. It's important that we that we also invest in people's success. So even somebody that may not be performing as well as they should or for whatever reason, let's put our best foot forward to make sure that we give them all the opportunities and support to be successful. And then when then if there's still failure or if there's still a need to move, the team is still not gelling, the next thing is you need to be open, transparent, and you need to communicate. Uh, the team in itself is going to recognize that there's maybe weakness in the team. So you can't let that, that weakness go unaddressed. And in some cases, unfortunately, you know, it may lead to having to, to let somebody go from your team. But we, we need to do that with a... I think a set of a set of principles that we build our companies on, or that we build our teams on, um, knowing that you know that when when we hire people, we're hiring with the intention of them being here for a long period of time, um, and and if that attitude comes through when we have to let someone go, I think it's a much more it's a much more you know. Um, I guess, sensitive way of, of making sure that tough decisions, when you have to make them, are still done with compassion, with respect for the individuals there. Um, and I think those elements are, are just sort of, they need to be inherent in, in any team as we build them. 